Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jacob Nessetril. Um, these days, I run API development at Oracle. Um, but uh, six years ago, I started uh, seven, six years ago, uh, I started a company called uh, Apiary. And uh, I actually started it, uh, I think, three months before the first API days was organized here in Paris, or six months or so. So I was still fresh of new ideas, and I came to Paris to the first API days, uh, and there were all these illuminaries from the API world. Um, uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, starting off the API design track today. Um, uh, as mentioned, Apiary, uh, I started a company called Apiary. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Apiary, um, it's a product for helping you design APIs, uh, document APIs, prototype APIs, mock them, test them, try them out, etc. Uh, it, uh, over the years, ended up accumulating um, one of the largest API design communities, probably the largest API community um, out there. And you know, these days, um, it's part of Cloud Native Computing Foundation as part of Oracle, um, supports Open API and supports API Blueprint. Now, um, with these many APIs under the hood in, in one place, um, people often come to me and ask me, you know, what, how should we design APIs and what is the right API design? Um, and so I wanted to take this moment, uh, starting off the API design track, to talk about some classics, which I think are not necessarily the most cutting edge and innovative, but I think they should set the stage for the rest of the day. And they're still tried and proven and, uh, and, and still valid. Um, so they come to me and they say, you know, what should we build our API like? What should it look like? How should we design it? Should it be a REST API? Or, you know, a while ago they were asking, should it be a hypermedia API? Uh, these days they ask more, you know, should it be a GraphQL API? And, uh, you know, so basically they're asking what is the golden standard? How should we build our API in order to make sure that it's the right API and that it works for everybody? Um, and the bad news is that there is no gold standard. It was true six years ago, and it's still true today, probably more, or more so than it was back then. Um, and so when we're thinking about why is that, what, what's the reason that there is no golden standard, I think it's really good to go back to start thinking a little bit about what API is to begin with. Um, so what is an API? Uh, well, if you Google, you know, you'll find out it's an application programming interface, which all of you know. That's why you're here. I'm not going to repeat that. But if you think a little bit more about what the interface stands for, there's two different meanings of it. One of them is out of the computing in industry. It's a device or a program enabling a user to communicate with a computer. Well, a device that enables the user to communicate with a computer sounds kind of like a user interface. Um, so I think it's a good analogy to start thinking about APIs as user interfaces to either data or to services. And once you make that mental leap and you start thinking about, you know, what does it mean for API to be a user interface? And actually, how do people who design user interfaces think? And what is their discipline? And how are they looking at the world? Um, well, then you quickly start coming up with a couple you know, words, like user experience, uh, which is obviously something that's very heavy in the user interface community. In the API community six years ago, certainly was not the case. Nowadays, thankfully, we have a whole API design track, and developer experience is actually a word. Um, but there's still a lot of others to be left, like uh, emotions. You know, I think nobody will doubt that user interface design is able to evoke emotions. Thinking that API design is able to evoke emotions is a little bit far-fetched for a lot of you, but I totally think that's the case. And so I will give you a couple examples, and I'll go into you know, more details what I mean by that. Um, but I think the most important thing to take out of all of this is it's fundamentally subjective. That you, know, you, 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 you wouldn't go out and start looking for the one right user interface for all different people around the world. And yet, we still keep doing that when we're going to APIs. Um, but if you think about it as a user interface, it is fundamentally subjective because it depends on who ends up being the user on the other side. And uh, 
it's also culturally dependent, which again in user interface design is not as much uh, controversial in API design, suddenly everybody perks up and says, what do you mean? What do you mean by culturally dependent? Well, maybe I'm, I'm not thinking about, I don't know, Asia versus Europe, but maybe I'm thinking about you know, Java developers versus JavaScript developers. Those end up being two large distinct groups of uh, developers who have a lot of culture associated with them through frameworks, through languages, through what they expect to be their standard and norm, what is intuitive for them. And so that, by default, um, creates something that uh, some diversity between the users of your API. Uh, but I think above all, um, in all efforts in the design community and in the user interface community, everybody strives for the perfection, um, for the ultimate goal, which is simplicity. And uh, simplicity, simpli simplicity isn't simple. As I'm sure you understand. Making something simple is actually very, very, very hard, uh, which is why API design ends up being hard. Um, and then when you kind of, I know that the colors probably are a bit washed out, but I highlighted them with a different color. When you start thinking a bit more about, you know, how can you measure these things? How can you actually look at some objective statistics on you know, is my design successful or not? Because it's so subjective, it's so human-centered, how, how can I actually make any sense of it? So one way you can think about it is you can try measuring productivity. That's a, that's a great way to approach a user interface design, and in the same way, it's a very good way to approach API design. You can set yourself some standardized um, goals, some standardized uh, workflows that you, know, you want the user to be able to accomplish, and then you can watch them and try to figure out how productive they are, how long it takes them. You can either watch them or you can try to perform the task yourself. You can measure conversion rates. Again, a completely tried and proven discipline in user interface design. Very you know, new and far-fetched in API design. I can try out a, different, a couple of different designs, pitch them next to each other, and see how many people actually end up using your API. How many of them will be successful, whether they are using it commercially or whether they are using it for free, but how many of them actually end up using your API repetitively. Um, you can also try to run usability studies, which uh, in the user interface design world is very common. In the API world, I think we often call them more hackathons. But, uh, uh, it, it is basically the same thing. You, you put the user out there to interact with your product, and then you have to be very, very methodically patient to not interact with them and take a step off, step back. And it is incredibly uncomfortable watching them squirm and trying to figure out how the hell the API works and being all frustrated about it, but it's also very um, telling. It, 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 it teaches you a lot. Uh, it's, I remember every single one of them that I've done both with user interfaces and with APIs, and it is deeply, deeply troubling. Every, I, I will never forget each one of those studies because uh, you pour your heart and love into your product and then you watch the user get all frustrated about how complicated it is. And, um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very telling discipline. So, um, you know, you can do all of these, you can go through all the motions of, uh, you know, trying usability studies and, 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 uh, and thinking about the API as being ultimately subjective. You can try all of these, go through the motions, and still fail. And uh, so to think a little bit deeper about what that is and why that happens, let's go back to the other definition of what actually an interface is. Um, and uh, in a more generic sense, and not just a computing sense, an interface is a point where two systems, subjects, or organizations meet and interact. So we've abstracted away from the computer already, and it's just an interface between, it's a boundary between two worlds, right? So what are the two worlds in the API context? Well, it's the person that's providing the API, and it's the person that's consuming the API, or the group of people. You can call it the server and the client or whatever you want, but ultimately it ends up being two groups of people. And I think we often fall into this pitfall, into this trap of thinking, well, hold on, uh, it's all just developers. You know, we're developers, they're developers, we're, you know, we're all developers, we're doing it for ourselves. And so by an extension of that is thinking, if I'm building an API that I would like to use, 
that by definition means I'm building an API that's a good API. Um, and I think it's, and, uh, yeah, I've, I've been in that trap myself several times. Um, and so I think it's important to understand that there are two different groups and to think how they're different, perhaps. Uh, and I will make some, you know, uh, some uh, uh, stereotyping right now. Um, so you do your own kind of thought analysis when you're building an API. But when you're thinking about perhaps, you know, the considerations, the thoughts that go into building an API on the provider side, then, you know, the team is thinking about things like, you know, uh, uptime of the API. Will I be able to keep my API up and running? Or am I building an API design? Am I building an API that's not going to be maintainable? Uh, how do I validate inputs so that my API doesn't crash or so that I don't get security issues? Uh, how do I cache the API to make sure that uh, it's performant enough? And, and of course, then the biggest uh, scare of them all, how can I version the API so that I can actually end of life it and sunset it and so that I don't have to support my misguided efforts uh, from years back forever and ever uh, uh, into the future. Um, but when you think about what the consumer side thinks about, what the developer that's trying to use an API is thinking about, the mindset is completely different, right? It's uh, the time to first hello world. How can I get a first proof of concept running up and running as quickly as possible? Um, is, are there examples? What's the debugging story? What's the error story? Um, can the API actually allow me to do what I want to do at all? You know, it, does it have the features that I need? Um, where do I get support? What's the latency? A completely different set of mental state when they're interacting with your API. So even there, uh, right there, if almost the same developer, if you put him into two different contexts, you know, their mental picture, their mental mindset is completely different when they're interacting with the API. But then, of course, we talked about how it's culturally dependent. So when you overlay this with the language that you're likely using as a developer on the server side and you're writing your API implementation, I don't know, in Node or, or in Go or Java or whatever floats your boat, but if you're consuming the API, you, of course, might also be consuming it on the server side from another server. But a lot of these times, you know, you're writing an app in Swift, or you're writing an Android app in, in Kotlin, for example, or, or a front-end app in React. And so things that you consider normal and intuitive are different from what normal and intuitive means to a back-end developer a lot of the times. So you know, we have this ever-present problem of user empathy. Um, and one thing that I wanted to show you is how different companies deal with this approach to user empathy. And in fact, not just how they deal with user empathy on the API level, but how they connect their visual, their user interface design, their almost corporate identity, the way they communicate visually, and then how they connect that down to the API level. Because I think those in well-functioning companies that work well end up being incredibly interconnected. The, the mission, the vision, what the company stands for, how it communicates on a visual level and how it communicates on an API level ends up very interwoven. Um, and to start off, I will use a darling of the API industry, by now a classic, uh, which is Stripe. Um, I assume I don't have to introduce Stripe, but uh, for, uh, I will do that anyway. Um, Stripe is a payment processor that allows you to accept credit cards. Um, they are one of the first companies that really came out and said, we're going to do an API for developers around the world to be able to accept credit cards in their products. By now, there's ample other companies out there that have taken this API-only approach. We are the infrastructure for developers to build on top of. Twilio is a great example that you might know. But in the API space, Stripe holds a special place. Before we get into their API, though, if you look at the home page, the way it's designed right now, uh, this is the latest screenshot. But in fact, in my previous presentations, um, I've had older front pages of Stripe. And uh, they were always communicating the same thing. They were incredibly Thank you. We're back. Um, they were incredibly simple. They were clean. They were almost communicating a certain amount of delight. Um, 
And that was always the go-to market for the company. That was their that was their reason for existence. We'll take something that is very obtuse and complicated. Thank you. And uh, and we will simplify it to the point it's actually pleasure. All right. No? OK. Well, I, I can scream without a microphone if you want me to, but it probably won't be recorded um, if you're recording it. Um, so, and, and the other example we talked about, Twilio, if you notice, they have the same mission statement, in fact. Take something that's incredibly obtuse and complicated, telco industry, and in this case, banking industry, nothing you want to deal with, right? The obtuse, horrible old standards, you know, industry that is very traditionalistic and, you know, has a lot of kind of momentum, takes ages to change, and they take that horrible thing you don't want to deal with and make it simple and pleasurable. In both cases, very, very similar go-to-market, very, very similar approach to tackling the problem. And so that mission statement, that, that vision of the company, ends up being reflected in the way they communicate visually. But if you drop down to the API level, Stripe, and the reason why it's near and dear to my heart and to many people in the API industry, was the first one to really introduce what nowadays is a completely standard way to present an API documentation, which is a nice, simple three-column view. Um, you know, if you want to uh, see how it looked like before. Well, actually, let's wait for the other example, and you'll see that in a minute. But uh, you know, it's a table of contents on the left-hand side. It's a very human-readable narrative in the middle that's designed to talk to you, and you can read it, and you can understand what's happening, and it's explained in human-friendly language. And then all the obtuse, complicated, you know, code and and and, and URLs and data structures is on the right-hand side. And. Uh, Nowadays, you look at this as a well, do, like every API documentation looks like that. Well, Stripe was the first one who came out with this. And so, in Apiary, we loved it very much. And uh, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And so, we decided that we want our documentation to look like this as well. And um, so, we designed our own, but we kind of followed the same concepts. And very quickly found out that it doesn't really work. And, uh, and we're trying to find, uh, like, scratching our heads a bit deeper, why doesn't it work for us? Why does it work for them? Um, well, the reason it didn't work for us is we've had hundreds of thousands of API developers building different APIs, and we were trying to shoehorn all of them into this design. And the reason why it didn't work is because this visual design expects the API to be simple. And if the API is not simple, the visual design does not work. If you have data structures, that span multiple different pages, it's an absolutely horrible idea to cram the data structure in the right-hand column in a very narrow space where it's going to expand to fill like four different screens, and, uh, and it's being a horrible experience. And so you can, you can have this way of communicating visually only if you have a certain design of the API and, in fact, the data structures underneath them. And I would probably go even a step further, and I would say that um, it's not just the way they designed their JSON payloads, which are small and which are simple, but it's even the way they're naming things, even the way they're naming their endpoints, they're naming their URLs. The objects that you interact with are named simply and appropriately. You know, charges, payments, users. Um, if you go to some other APIs, that is certainly not the case. Uh, and so what I'm trying to demonstrate here is this interconnectedness between how the company com communicates visually on a company level, how it communicates visually f to the developers on the API level, and how it communicates through the API itself in the data structures and in the name it names things in that API. Um, so if you go back to the uh, it, to, to scroll down just a little bit further in that home page, you know, you'll see this developer first approach and that developer first, and right there on the home page, it has this little snippet also pioneered by Stripe way back. You know, look, if you want to make a payment, copy these five lines of code, drop them in your code and you're done. So it's just another example of how it communicates. Things are simple. It's a pleasure. It's exciting.
So this sounds great. This is a positive example of API design. And it would be easy to fall into the trap of thinking, well, OK, that's great. Now we know how to do this right. We all have to be simple. We all have to have very simple names. We all have to have pleasing, smooth design. And it's a trap that the designers themselves in the user interface community fall into as well, that everything has to be beautiful, and everything has to have rounded corners, and everything has to be simple. And there are counterexamples to that. In the visual community, one of the big counterexamples of a hugely successful design of a big company, uh, for those of you who are US, you might know that company, is Craigslist. Craigslist is advertising online. It's a horrible design. It hasn't changed from the 90s. It completely skipped 2000s. It worked the same in you know, NCSA Mosaic and in, in, in Google Chrome. Uh, it's absolutely awful, and yet people absolutely love it. And um, if you dig it a little bit deeper into the visual design, you'll find out that there are types of companies who have horrible design, not by accident, but on purpose. Uh, in fact, if you look at your local discount stores, for you know, cheap food and cheap groceries, they end up you know, sending you these flyers with discounts every week. They're horribly designed, and that's no accident. They're horribly designed because that poor design communicates cheap, and that is what you want to communicate subconsciously on a visual level. Um, so I'm not going to go as far as to say that the next company I'm going to present is cheap, certainly not. But I want you to look at that contrast and think a little bit about why that contrast is there and how they communicate differently. And that second company is AWS. I guess I don't have to introduce to you the company or what it does. But if you look at their API, it is awful. It is awful. And the way you communicate the API is awful. That looks out of the 90s as well, and it's a screenshot from this year. You know, it's an XML, it's not syntax highlighted, there's absolutely no human-friendly explanation. Then what is that? But then, you know, when you think about it, what does AWS as a company try to communicate? It certainly isn't simple, right? We're tr trying to communicate scale, huge, warehouse, you know, bare bones, cheap, cheap in a certain sense, like rock bottom prices achieved through scale, right? So they're trying to make you think of this Amazon warehouse full of books and other things that you buy, and it's spanning hundreds of miles, and, and, and everything is automated, and there's huge factory floors, and everything is so cheap because it's so big. And they end up doing that same on the corporate identity level and even on the API design level. Um, if you go to their AWS homepage these days, it looks a lot better than it used to uh, just a couple of months ago. But even this is not simple. I mean, don't confuse the icons being pretty uh, with simple. It is not simple. And that is not the list of products. That's the list of product categories. If you click on each one of them, there's like 15 different products in there. So all in all, you're looking at a couple hundred products on that screen. That is not simple, right? If you want to be simple, you do the Apple Think, four different product lines. MacBook, Mac, iPhone, watch, go away, that's it. Um, that is not simple. But that's because they're not in a business to communicate simple. They're in a business to communicate scale and robust. And they do this on the visual level, and they do it on the API level as well. So I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional that they're still learning XML. And a lot of us have that associated with these large enterprise services and SOAP and, and you know, scalable and huge. Um, but certainly, they're not trying to simplify down to the bare minimum because they don't have to, because they, as a company, are different and they stand for different values and communicate differently. So those were two quick examples of why the question of what is the right API design and what is the golden standard for API design hasn't been decided six years ago, is not decided today, and won't be decided six years from now either. Uh, why it's going to be a perennial, constant question, and we're going to be keep going back and forth. There's always going to be new, hot, trendy ideas, just as there are in visual design. Uh, but the underlying condition is that we're trying to build user empathy. And with the changing user, with the changing person on the other side, so is the field of API design changing. Thank you very much.